A lot of people who are only half paying attention to the election campaign more or less assumed it was in the bag for the Tories. But now the polls have been closing a bit, they're having to focus for the first time on the real possibility of Jeremy Corbyn becoming Prime Minister. And that means almost certainly that Diana Abbott would take over the Home Office and she joins me now. Diana Abbott, a lot of people watching this programme after Manchester thinking about who to vote for look at you and look at Jeremy Corbyn and think, do you know what, we don't completely trust you to be in charge of the security of this country, given what you have said in the past, some of the things you have done in the past. You can take a moment now to, to as it were, talk to them and tell them why they're wrong about you. Well, first of all, before we move on to the politics of it, I think it's too soon to forget the victims, 22 people dead, and also so many people, families and children, mm. who have seen things which will haunt them for many years. Quite right. We have and, talked a lot about the victims, but quite but right. But I think it's important to say that. In terms of why people should vote Labour in the forthcoming general election, they should vote Labour because we've put forward a manifesto which will be a transforming manifesto which is talking about investment in the NHS and education and is also saying how we would fund it. And I'm going to come on to that manifesto in some detail in a moment. But before we do, I just want to ask about your own record and people looking at you and they say, I don't trust Diane Abbott to be in charge of the Home Office. Well, first of all, I think there's something to be said for a Home Secretary who's actually worked in the Home Office. I worked in the Home Office for nearly three years as a graduate trainee, and I know how it works from the inside. I think there's something to be said for a Home Secretary who is a very young woman, worked and campaigned with diverse communities, and sees these issues not just from the point of view of bureaucrats, but from the point of view of diverse communities. And there's also something to be said for a Home Secretary who spent 30 years as a constituency MP and knows how these issues impact on ordinary people. What about a Home Secretary who has in the past said that we should abolish MI5? Well... I think you've got that from some... Uh... Early day motion which you signed in 1989. I can read it back to you if you'd like me to. She said she called for the abolition of conspiratorial groups like MI5 and Special Branch, which are not accountable to the British people. Signed by Diane Abbott. At that time... I and a lot of people felt that MI5 needed reforming. It has since been reformed, and of course I would not call for its abolition now. So, so you have, that Diane Abbott statement has gone, and you're pro-MI5, you're a no, supporter of MI5. No, I'm saying that MI5 has gone. It's been reformed, it's a different MI5, and that's why so many of us are able to support it now. And you fully support it, because also in your career in the House of Commons, you voted again and again around 30 times against anti-terrorist legislation for different reasons. What you have to remember is that on many of those occasions, I and Jeremy Corbyn were going through the lobby with Tory MPs. Theresa May herself voted against the 2005 Prevention of Terrorism Bill. She voted against ID cards and she voted against control orders without right. sufficient legal legal intervention. And my point is this, nobody votes against these things um, without a lot of thought. And the view of myself and Jeremy and most of the members of the Conservative Party, including David Davis at the time, was this was counterproductive, counter-terror legislation. Okay, so, and so some, of the positions, to, some of the positions we voted for were upheld in the courts. Let me come on to your bit. You say nobody votes against these kind of things without a lot of thought. Shortly before 9-11, you voted against prescribing al-Qaeda as an organisation. That was a huge mistake on your part, was it not? Have you actually read the legislation we were voting on? I have read the legislation and I've looked at the, the addendums as well. And I've got here. what the legislation brought forward was a whole list of organisations, some of which some people would argue were not terrorist organisations, but dissident organisations. Well, and to say that because... Okay. I, uh, to say which, which ones? Because I've got the list here. Al-Qaeda, Egyptian Islamic Jihad, the Armed Islamic Group, Harakat Mujahideen, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil, uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad group, Islamic Army of Aden, the Abu Nidal organisation, the Kurdish work, Kurdistan Workers' Party. Which of these should not be prescribed? The titles are one thing, but the reality of some of those groups, whether they were dissidents in their country of origin, and that's why some of us were not willing... Had, it, had they taken out Al-Qaeda 
as one thing, that would have been something. But you know, this is a, this is a group of really dangerous organisations from all around the world, many of whom have killed a lot of people. Lashka e Taiaba carried out the 2008 Mumbai attacks, which killed more than 170 people. That was on the list. This was, a, you know, no list is perfect, but it was a pretty good list. And you voted against prescribing those groups because there were groups on that list which I deem to be dissidents rather than terror organisations. You have to give people credit for thinking about how they vote. As I said to you earlier, we're hearing about all this anti-terror legislation that Jeremy and I voted against, but we're not hearing that the Tories voted against some of the self-same legislation, particularly control orders and detention without trial. Well, there is the list. Which of those organisations do you think not, should not have been prescribed? Because, you know, you voted against the whole lot being prescribed because presumably some of them you thought were OK. I'm just wondering which ones you think are OK. It's not that I thought they were OK. I thought that they were dissident organisations. You could have the and list, you, know, you could like it. No, I don't need it, Andrew, because the point is, at this point, less than a week after those people died in Manchester, we should be talking about how we, we go forward to make this country safe. But to know how to go forward, we have to look behind and look at people's records, which is why I've been talking about you. Mm. Now, Jeremy Corbyn got into some trouble with Andrew Neil in his interview where he said he had not met the IRA, and he was then photographed lots of people from the IRA during the course of his career. You yourself said that it would be um, a defeat for the British state would be a great liberation, a great move forward at that period of time. Do you regret your support for the IRA right back in the 80s? The, that particular quote you're referring to comes from a now defunct left newspaper and it had as well as but this you said it, didn't you? no 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 but what i'm saying to you is this it was 34 years ago i had a rather splendid afro at the time i don't have the same hairstyle and Do you I have don't the same views? have the same views. It is 34 okay, years on. The hairstyle has gone, and some of the views have gone. So you you no longer uh, in any you you regret the fact of what you said then about the IRA. The hairstyle has gone. The views have gone. We've all moved on in 34 years, have, haven't you, Andrew? We've all moved on. I'm just wondering, do you regret what you said about the IRA at the at the the, the height of the bombing? What specifically do you want me to regret? I mean, well, you, you, I can read the quote for you and find it here. Basically, what you said was that a defeat of the IRA would be uh, devastating for the British people, and it was, a, a defeat for the British state was a good thing, you said, at the time when the IRA was attacking the British state. And you said that the reason for the violence was entirely caused by the British presence in Northern Ireland. I'm saying, do you think those statements now are wrong? It was 34 years ago. I've moved on. You've moved on. All right. I've got the quote here, finally. You said, the, the, the Ireland is our struggle. Every defeat of the British state is a victory for all of us. A defeat in Northern Ireland will be a defeat indeed, was the quote. Um, 34 years ago, and I've moved on. OK. And within a few weeks, you could be Home Secretary. And one of the things we know from Amber Rudd, that she spends two hours a day signing orders, uh, approving the surveillance of individual people. Would you be prepared to sit there now and do that? Of course, if, if the evidence was presented to me. Remember, I was a Home Office civil servant. I know how these things work. So if the files were put in front of me, evidence were put in front of me, of course I'll sign mm. orders for surveillance. That's very much part of the job. OK, let's turn to another big issue, I think, today, which is um, encrypted services on, on WhatsApp and other um, mobile messaging devices. Do you oppose or support um, forcing those companies to reveal what they're doing? I think the problem with a lot of these companies, they're American companies, and they feel very strongly about the right to free speech and so on. But we do have to work with them to allow us to access some of these messages. There is an issue about end-to-end -end encryption. We have to work with them. And if they're not willing to cooperate, we do have to consider what further action we could take. But I would hope, given the tragedy in Manchester, that these companies would want to work with the British government. OK. Let's turn to something else. Again, I'm afraid reported in today's papers, which is that as recently as 2010, you told a dinner party, we shouldn't put innocent people's DNA on the database, fair point, and we shouldn't even have guilty people on that database either. Again, as somebody who's going to be Home Secretary, do you still support that statement? What you have to remember is I'm also a constituency MP, and I had to deal with some very difficult cases of children Children who not actually be convicted of anything, who had their DNA on the database, and I had a huge struggle to get their DNA taken off. So yes, we do need to be careful about being taking children's DNA. Children who have not you, been convicted you of a crime. You didn't use the word children there. Yes, because I don't know 
where that story comes from. But what was on my mind was the case I was dealing with at the time about a child whose DNA had been taken. So it can be very, very clear. In terms of retaining a strong DNA national database, are you in favour of that or against it? I'm in favour of a DNA database. I'm not in favour of keeping the DNA of children who've committed no crime. Only children. So anybody else who's guilty of some crime or has been found guilty of that, their DNA should be kept. Do you yes, agree with course. that? Yes, you do agree course. with that. OK, well, let's move on. One of your big announcements has been uh, lots more officers, um, including another 1,000 people for the security services. Now, they are already increasing by 1,000 after David Cameron's government. Is this a, another 1,000 beyond that? No, we'd, but that 1,000 hasn't been recruited. And what we're saying They're doing is, it at the moment, they say. We, they say, but they haven't recruited them yet. So we're saying that we want to recruit 10,000 extra police officers, community police officers, because we think community policing is key. We want to recruit 3,000 extra firefighters, 3,000 extra prison officers, 1,000, as you say, people in the security field, and 500 more border guards, okay. because we think protecting our border is so important. So you know the next question. How much, will the extra, how much extra are you going to spend on MI5? All to get well on MR5, we're not spending extra because the government's put the money aside. All together, so this the, is not really a new announcement at all. No, well, it's, it's part of our community safety pledge card, and all together, the things we're talking about the 10,000 extra policemen, police officers. And remember, the reason that we've had to we've had to promise 10,000 extra police officers is that on Theresa May's watch, there are 20,000 police officers down. So the cost of the entire package, which is 10,000 extra police officers, 3,000 firefighters, 3,000 prison yeah, officers, right. okay. 1,000 security people and 500 board guards, will be 417 million. Got the number. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, in the Labour Party manifesto, it says, freedom of movement will end when we leave the European Union. No ifs, no buts. Um, are you in support of that policy? Well, freedom of movement obviously ends when we leave the EU. We only have freedom of movement as part and parcel of being in the EU. And so the Labour government will end it? If we leave the European Union, freedom of movement ends. What we should be talking about is the immigration arrangements we have when freedom of movement ends. There's Ab no question that it ends when we come okay, out of the it's EU. Ju it's just that you have said ending free movement has become a synonym for anti-immigrant racism. I, as I Which think... Which suggests that the Labour I, Party manifesto has got lots of anti-immigrant racism in it. No, I don't think you're reading the manifesto properly. Of course, I think that anti-immigrant rhetoric is toxic and actually very bad for business. Um, we, we've, we are seeing the numbers of EU migrants going down at a time when we are 24,000 nurses short. So anti-immigrant rhetoric is unpleasant but also bad for the economy but on freedom of movement freedom of movement ends okay. when we come out of the EU. If you win the election and you become Home Secretary you will be the first black person in any one of the major four offices of state. It'll be a huge change. Will you run the Home Office differently in terms of its attitude to racism, communities and so forth? Will we notice a step change having a black Home Secretary running the Home Office? I will run the best Home Office that I can. I'll draw on my experience having worked there. I'll draw on my experience as an MP at the grassroots. But I, we will have the best Home Office that I can run, which will draw on some of the Home Office's best traditions. And above all, we'll keep this country safe.